Hello and welcome to the World Economic Forum session, Accelerating Digital Inclusion in a Post-COVID World. I'm the moderator. My name is Andy Serwer. I'm the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Finance. We have a star-studded panel here today that I will introduce in a minute or two. And we also have an exciting initiative uh, that we're introducing uh, through the World Economic Forum. Again, I will talk about that in one minute or two. Um, just to give you uh, an idea about the structure here today, the first half hour of the session will be a, a public forum um, where we'll hear from the, the panelists and have a discussion on this topic about digital inclusion. And then the second half will be for members on TopLink, uh, a discussion amongst uh, uh, those members. So um, digital inclusion in a post-COVID world, it's obviously a front and center topic uh, for, for all of us, really, all citizens of the globe. And obviously what's happened during COVID is that this issue of divides has been highlighted, if not exacerbated, by many of the factors that have we've seen during COVID. And this has certainly been true in terms of what's happened on the digital side of things. Um, obviously, connectivity networks and being able to connect with colleagues, friends, and family is essential and incredibly uh, critical during this time. And so what it means is if you don't have connection to the network, um, you're not going to be able to work. You're not going to be able to go to school. You're not going to be able to see your friends and family. And so this divide, which maybe uh, was always a problem, is much more of a problem right now. And as we look to move into 2021 and we hope uh, move beyond COVID, um, it's time, we think, for all of us to work on this problem and make sure that we have inclusion, not only when it comes to economic factors, but when it comes to networking and connectivity as well. So with that, I would like to bring in our distinguished panel. And um, we're, uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Hans Vesberg, who is the chairman and CEO of Verizon. Uh, Verizon is also uh, the parent company of Yahoo, I should point out. Um, we have a minister, Paula Ingabiri, who is the Minister of Information Communication Technologies uh, from Rwanda. And also welcome. And we also have uh, Robert Smith, the founder, the chairman, and the CEO of Vista Equity Partners. So great to see all of you. Um, before we begin, I I'd like to talk just briefly and maybe set up a, 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 a comment by Hans Vesberg, uh, this initiative that I mentioned um, that's being introduced this morning, uh, today, I should say, by the World Economic Forum. It's Edison. It is the first global mobilization of public sector and industry leaders um, to head on, square on, address this problem of connecting people um, and helping people participate in the digital economy. Um, so uh, all the people on this panel are board members. And in fact, Hans, you're the chairman of the board. And so um, you're a busy guy, obviously, a lot to do. And so this must be pretty darn important for you to take time to, uh, to do this. So I wonder if we could start with you and maybe you could just talk a little bit about what the Edison Alliance means. Thank you, Andy, and uh, uh, you're right, this is darn important. I mean, I think we've heard through all the panels at the World Economic Forum in the last couple of days that uh, uh, 2020 has been a year like anything else. I mean, it's so different, the COVID-19, and it's not uh, going away. We will continue to have this impact on people with the COVID-19 and economy and all of that. So it, it is a really, really tough time. And uh, it also has changed a lot of things, as you mentioned in the beginning, and everything from working is now remote work, healthcare is telemedicine, um, entertainment is live streaming. Everything has basically changed. And what we need to understand that this is not new concepts. I think that way many of us have been talking about digital education, remote learning, telemedicine for years. It's what happened in 2020 was that we leap from at least five to seven years in the digital uh, inclusion in the world or the digital advancement in the world. 
that is just unheard of because usually it takes a, a progression when you you include it in the digital uh, uh, sort of transformation you're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, for the last 10 years, I've actually been talking about that mobility broadband and the cloud is a 21st century infrastructure because it's efficient, it's scalable, and it's sustainable. It has to be the most important platform we have in order to support uh, uh, the mankind on Earth. And we have seen how important it has been the last five to seven years. And putting that in the perspective of the sustainable development goals, all of those goals are underpinned by the mobility broadband and cloud. And, uh, and it has been seen more than ever. So I think that is so important. But we also need to be clear that the work that governments, private sectors, different industries, ICT sectors have done the last nine to 12 months is just unheard of to pulling these together. Still, it's three, over three billion people on this earth that are not online. And, uh, and of course, here we are now facing the uh, enormous great opportunity, at the same time, a great risk. The, the, the opportunity is obvious. We can now accelerate an inclusive world by using digitally that we've never done before because we have proven that these tools are working. Uh, and uh, you can, it doesn't matter where you are born or where you live, you should be able to get it. The risk is, of course, that we are accelerating the divide in our society by, using, by this digital transformation we see right now. And suddenly we actually have more people behind, especially uh, vulnerable uh, groups and populations on earth. So that's why the importance is more important than ever to create a, a cross-sector, public-private, in industrial alliances together to see what we're doing to accelerate this. That was the idea behind the Edison Alliance that we uh, were now launching officially, uh, which has a clear target to have measurable targets per year, how we move forward on this acceleration of digital inclusion. The first year we're gonna focus on healthcare, education and financial inclusion. All of them are supporting the SDGs as well. And again, it's not the ICT sector, it's not enough. We need all industries. We need the public sector and we need all the industries alliances together to see that we do that. And we're, we're not going to replicate what anybody else is doing. We will bring all together and see how do we together accelerate this now. Because it's a unique moment in history that we can use the digital inclusion or the digital technologies in order to, to bridge the digital divide. And uh, the work we have seen the last seven or eight months has been so crucial. So that's sort of the setup. We have a great board uh, with uh, multi-sector and all, you see three of the board members here. We are adding uh, Ajay Banga, the executive chairman of, of MasterCard. And then we also have Shabana Kamiri, Kamiri, which is the general manager of the Apollo Hospital, which is one of the largest hospitals in India. So we have a very broad group, but we also have a lot of the champions on this call uh, from different sectors. And uh, today is the official launch, and uh, we will talk about it more. But this is such a crucial moment, and uh, you, you, you asked me, uh, this has to be important. Yes, this is super important, and uh, I feel that this is something that I am prepared to support and help, and that's why I'm joining, and I hope that many of my peers will see the same and, uh, and, and definitely be part of this. So that, that's the reason and what we're launching today, uh, Annie. Thank you, Hans. And um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of ways for people on this call and beyond that to participate and get involved in this initiative. So look forward to hearing about that. Um, I want to switch over to Minister Ingabiri and to get your take on the state of play in Rwanda and maybe the surrounding regions in terms of the challenges. And then also hear from you from the public policy standpoint of what you think some of the solutions could be. Minister. Thanks, uh, Andy. I think um, when you look at um, how many of the countries within the region have, you know, weathered during the pandemic, it makes it even more urgent to think about um, digital inclusion. Had, had we uh, been able to really, uh, you know, uh, sort of shorten or, you know, closing on the digital divide gap that we are seeing, not just uh, within the region, but for many of the developing economies, then most likely we would have been able to weather even much better. But nonetheless, I think what we're also seeing is that uh, 
for even the progress that we are seeing um, even uh, today, a lot of it is thanks to some of the investments that have been made uh, over the past few years uh, in putting in place the right digital infrastructure, much as it's not, um, you know, uh, comprehensive to the, you know, to, to at least to the scale that we would really want to. We still see a huge divide. I think when we look at the statistics of 3.6 billion people that are still left unconnected, the majority are on the African continent in the developing uh, countries. And so uh, that in itself um, goes a long way to show uh, that, you know, as we talk about the digital divide, as we talk about digital inclusion post the COVID world, then it becomes more and more urgent uh, for some of our economies. Uh, but nonetheless, I think we start to see um, what, what has helped us by and large is also uh, what we continue to see, the social contract uh, that governments have with their people that have really played uh, a, a big role in even, you know, having faith in, you know, some of the measures that government is putting in place, investments, the awareness and sensitization that is being created. And that, of course, comes in to complement the different uh, investments that have been made uh, when it comes to uh, digital inclusion or different digital aspects from connectivity to skills and content, to say the least. Now, to your second part of the question around, um, you know, when we're talking about policies, uh, by and large, I think what we're looking at is how do we create the right policy, regulatory, and business environment that is conducive and attractive for partnerships going forward? Uh, because be it government, you will, will not have enough resources uh, to bridge uh, this divide, um, you know, to the level and as fast as possible as we would wish to. But also the private sector on their own won't be able to do it. So how do we bring in those partnerships? How do we think about um, aggregated demand. We, 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 um, Hans just talked about healthcare, fintech, and uh, education going to be, you know, the first initial um, areas of focus for the Edison Alliance board. Uh, but think about the needs that of connectivity that exist in those pockets or, or in those sectors. Uh, then rather than think about siloed implementation of what are their connectivity needs, how do we drive digital inclusion in those specific, um, you know, industries? How do we think about it as aggregated demand, which will allow us to really um you know you know tap into these economies of scale lower the cost of of, of really ensuring that uh, we you know we bring everyone on board and make sure that everyone is connected in a meaningful uh, manner and of course understanding that connectivity is always going to be the bedrock the enabler for all all of these things that we're discussing my final point on on uh, policies of course what we need to be thinking about is you know from a whole range of infrastructure sharing policies to uh, sort of bring down the cost of uh, investing in in the in the last mile connectivity infrastructure we're looking at to thinking about how do we build digital citizens how do we give them the right skills uh, because they're going they're going to be the consumers of what we put out uh, to their disposal so I'll pause there and 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 we'll come back to some of unpack some of these uh, ideas at a later stage indeed thank you very much minister great stuff I want to switch over to Robert Smith. And Robert, as someone who has uh, worked in and invested in the ICT sector for a number of decades, mm -hmm. um, I, I want to get your perspective from the private sector. And, uh, you know, the, the old line is, well, you know, certain parts of our economy don't have the ROI requisite for you guys to get involved. And so that's a challenge, right, for, for the private sector. How do you overcome that and work with the public sector to actually bridge this divide? Thanks, Andy. Uh, the way we overcome it is what we are doing with this Edison Alliance, which is through leadership. And I have to thank Hans and other executives who over the last eight, nine, 10 months have not only identified what the issues are, but are now putting real tangible solutions and infrastructure to solve these problems. And the Edison Alliance, I believe, is, is, is likely to be one of the more effective. You know, for decades and years, we've all talked about, well, we need to understand the problem. We have studied this, we have the analysis, we have the data, uh, and we have, we have uh, the mechanisms to understand how to solve these problems. Um, action in this, in this environment involves a couple of things. One is broadband connections, it's devices, it's software, and it's a maintenance ecosystem for that, in, that, eco, that infrastructure, which actually is a wonderful local job creator. And it points mm -hmm. a little bit to what Paula was saying. It's how do you actually get this younger generation to be part of this digital economy? Uh, and part of them can be you know, providers of digital services to small, medium businesses, education, healthcare providers, uh, in their own local communities. And we have to continue to build the infrastructure to make that happen. 
broadband is the key. That is the infrastructure uh, dynamic that will make all of the difference. It, it can eliminate the, the education deserts, the healthcare deserts, the business deserts, the ability to drive capital and, and, and infrastructure, uh, enterprise software infrastructure into small to medium businesses. And we need available, affordable, and adoptable, call it readiness capacity uh, in our communities. You know, in the area of education, which is one of the areas I'm really focused on, you know, we've done a study with Power School and McKinsey, and we've looked at every single community in America. We know we can sort it by, you know, the African-American population that in the broadband penetration, we know exactly how many families and students are disconnected in every community. We know exactly what broadband carriers are, are either backhaul capability there and don't have last mile, mile built out. And so now it comes to how do we form the partnership? to ensure that we can actually get the connectivity in those communities. Because once you create the connectivity for education, guess what? You now have the ability to deliver telemedicine uh, uh, solutions into those communities and the ability to deliver uh, 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 solutions for small to medium businesses. From an ROI perspective, Andy, it's, it's, it's a farce to think that there's not a return on that. To give an example, in a small business, typical software businesses that I live in, an enterprise business, it's still a 600% ROI for utilizing enterprise software for productivity in business. For a small to medium business, it's over 900%. So the real question is how do we create the, the call it the economic um, uh, uh, mechanism such that the device manufacturers, the broadband manufacturers, the, and, and the businesses can come to some equilibrium that actually enables an expansion of the economy. If you just actually eliminate the wealth gap, uh, in, in that context through business, it's a one and a half trillion uh, dollar increase to the GDP of just the U.S. by doing that for the African-American community. It's an economic imperative. It's a moral imperative. And now we have to drive policy imperatives uh, to make that happen. And we're I'm encouraged. We just released yesterday through the Business Roundtable. There's other groups that corporate call to action led by Chairman Wooten in, in, in the state of Connecticut and at least uh, released uh, to, to the Biden-Harris administration priorities of the agenda. And number one that we listed was broadband infrastructure, because we know if we get that right, it would enable massive uplift of economic opportunity and frankly, job creation and drive us out of what would, could be a, a dire recession coming out of COVID-19. So I'm encouraged and I'm thankful, very thankful for Hans and, and WEF for their, their leadership in making us forward. And I, like to say in the words of Amanda Gorman, our, our, our brilliant citizen in America, if we merge mercy with might, might with right, and love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. We have the power and the passion to do this right now, and we have the people focused on doing it. Quoting our junior poet laureate, that's, that's, <laughs> that's outstanding. That's great. And, and thank you for your insight, uh, Robert. And I can, I can see the passion there and for dispelling some of those myths as well. That's, that's great stuff. Um, I want to draw people's attention to the chat, which, as we all know now in this COVID world, is the game inside the game. Um, so you can participate and communicate with uh, your, your fellow participants there. And Hans, I want to go back to you. And it actually, it sort of speaks to one of the comments that someone made here. Mary M. Rahim um, made this point about the digital divide not existing only in high and low income countries. And Robert touched on this as well, but also within wealthy countries. And so my question is, Hans, there's so many, I, I, you know, problems slash opportunities here to address. How are you guys going to decide where to deploy your resources and your efforts? Because you could, there's a lot of work to be done in the United States, the you know, wealthiest country on the planet. And, you know, you could just do all your work there, but obviously it's a global issue, of course. Uh, you are right, and, and, and the comment is also right. Uh, with the leapfrog of five to seven years, we see the, the digital divide in any country of the world. So that's why the platform of World Economic Forum, Forum the multi-sector representation, the public-private, the geographical distribution we have of both the board and the champions is of essence, because this is not one country solution. And it, it's all about partnership and doing it right. So I think that's right. So a couple of things, I mean, uh, when I think about it, I mean, it, it, I see a three-prone challenge here. And I think that Robert was into it. First is the accessibility, accessibility of broadband. You have to have broadband. 
Secondly is, of course, to make it affordable. And, and finally, to have those softwares that is giving telemedicine or if it's a, a remote learning, whatever. So all these three things to come together. And then you really understand that that is a work that has to come public-private because we're touching in different places here. And there are good works done by organizations like GSMA, the Broadband Commission that are thinking about this. So we need to bring this all together, together with the private and public and see that we are even much more surgical in finding those ways and improving. And just alert more and more people on this earth, the importance of it, and seeing that we, we find these financial solutions uh, for, for capital coming in, uh, as Robert talked about, and I know the Broadband Commission is talking about, GSMA is talking about, finding new models, and uh, uh, the Minister, Paula Ingeberg, talked about it as well. So, but also seeing that we, we, we make usable software, and uh, we all like uh, uh, the entertainment uh, that came with the COVID-19 and we can be home and see everything. But here we're talking about remote learning. We're talking about telemedicine applications, softwares that can be in the cloud in order to be remotely efficient and sustainable wherever you are. And that has to be scaled now. We have talked about it for years and we knew the solution. Now we finally have the pivot moment where the world actually understands this is working. We can scale it. And then we have all the big tech in the world starting to scale. And Robert is one of them. There are hundreds of others as well. And this is the time. So I think that, again, if we don't make it now I mean, and see that we make a digital inclusion, I don't know what a better moment we would have. Or it's a bad moment, I would say. It's not a good moment. But what we're creating right now, it's a leap of five to seven years or the digital uh, journey. And now we want, we want to see that we can actually make this happen for more and more people on this earth. Thank you, Hans. Minister Ingebir, I wanna go back to you and maybe ask you a little bit about best practices um, when it comes to public-private partnerships or initiatives that you have in your own country, but maybe also around the world. And what sort of examples and paradigms are you looking to um, to address these issues. Thanks, Andy. So I'll, I'll, I'll start by looking at some of the examples that we already have uh, existing. Um, so for one, a couple of years ago, as we were thinking about deploying, um, you know, we, we'd already worked with the different telecommunication companies. We'd been able to put in place a, a fiber optic backbone connecting all the, you know, 30 districts and border points of our country. And we were now thinking about how do we uh, think about deploying a 4G network across uh, the country. And so part, part of what we did was to, you know, scout around and find a partner who uh, had the skills and resources to uh, partner with government and enter into a partnership uh, PPP model that would allow uh, for deployment of this uh, 4G network. And so that's how we've been able to deploy, um, you know, uh, a 4G network that is covering more than 97% coverage of the entire country, thanks to the partnership that uh, Rwanda has had with uh, the government of Rwanda has had together with the Korea Telecom Network. But that's not only the example, because when you look at even uh, the kind of last mile, um, you know, connectivity that we're doing across the country to ensure that, you know, we, we can uh, reach everyone in an affordable and inclusive manner, a lot of it has been through the partnerships that we're having with the local, uh, you know, telecommunication industry. Now, this is just on the connectivity bit. Uh, then we now have to think about, we, we, uh, both uh, Robert and Hans did talk about whether looking at content, software, devices, and one of the things we've been thinking about is how do we unlock that? Because it's one thing to have the highway, the connectivity infrastructure in place, but it's another thing to make sure it's usable. And so when you look at the statistics of coverage versus uh, penetration, there's a big gap. And, and that gap is because we need to unlock um, the, the ability for our citizens to be able to uh, affordably, um, you know, acquire these smart devices, uh, be able to use these digital platforms that we are putting in place. So we need to be thinking about relevant local content that they can use and, 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 and you know, take advantage of these investments that are being made. Uh, and so and also the skills bit. And so what we've been doing on the skills bit is how do we partner with local communities? Uh, we've, we've put in place a program called the Digital Ambassadors, where we're getting students that are out of uh, university and we're placing them in different communities. And their role is to go out and train citizens on the basic digital literacy skills because we need them to be equipped. 
And then the device manufacturing part, it's also thinking about who are these manufacturers that can build affordable devices uh, that really will match the purchasing power of our people. Uh, because we won't pretend that any device that you'll find on, you know, on any global market, every, everyone will afford it on the African continent. So how do we start to think about those specific devices that can be used to access these services and information that we're putting on the different platforms? So I must say that it, just in a nutshell to respond to your question, I think we look at it holistically. We know we can't do it all. Partnerships is really what has unlocked uh, the progress that we continue to see uh, in most parts of this uh, developing world. That's great. And I'm so glad you addressed that issue of affordability, Paula, because that was something that people were questioning here in the chat. And it's obviously a, a critical, critical one. Robert, I wonder if you wanted to follow up on that. But I also had another question about just generally speaking, chief executive officers of uh, the private sector, maybe especially in the United States. Do they really get this? Because, you know, you hear people talking about diversity and inclusion, and then they're not walking the talk. You hear people talking about a digital divide, divide and I'm wondering, are people walking the talk here as well? So probably a two-part question for you. Yeah, and I think we can, we can, we can address that. On an affordability, you know, I, I look to uh, a couple of uh, instances that, that, that are working well. I look at what Mukesh Ambani is doing in India and what he's done with GEO and the devices and the affordability and you know, like all things, he kind of prices the devices relative to what that family can afford and then starts to deliver applications and solutions uh, that are actually beneficial to the family and the individuals who are using that. And yeah, I think, again, you have to look at the ecosystem in its entirety to think about how do you manage the economic rent in it to improve the station and quality of opportunity for, for the citizenry in individual countries. And, you, and that's, you know, that is a great model to evaluate and to look at. In the U.S., one of the things that, that we've been working with uh, uh, companies like Bank of America, which I think they've done a wonderful job coming forward with this equality, progress, sustainability bond. Now, you think about it. One of the advantages we have in this environment today is low interest rates. Well, why not have corporate CEOs who say, listen, the right answer for us is to go issue these bonds. Bank of America issued a $2 billion bond. I think it's you know, 70 basis points. Uh, in terms of what it, what it, what the yield is, et cetera, oversubscribed. And what's neat about it is the first bond that actually has uh, uh, distinguishes the use of proceeds to actually go against some of these uh, sustainability goals and DEI initiatives very specifically. And if you take top 50, top 100 corporations in America, and they start issuing these bonds every six months, every year, that actually creates capital in the marketplace that A, investors are interested in, B, can actually now solve these problems very specifically in building out infrastructure, building out last mile. It might be subsidy. It might actually be, you know, development that has real economic return and also build out training centers, which I think is one of the most important things. If you build training centers that for, for MSP or, or managed service providers, it creates jobs. And jobs are the thing that actually in a local community actually create the economic uplift. If you have, you know, young people who learn how to be service technicians and they can serve, you know, the, 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 the restaurants, the doctor's offices, the dentist offices, the healthcare clinics. And that's an individual business that now can support a family uh, that, that, you know, through, through, uh, through servicing the infrastructure and capacity, uh, digital infrastructure capacity for that neighborhood, for that community then of course can help drive more, more, more capital into that community. So part of the, the walk the walk for CEOs, one thing CEOs absolutely can do beyond saying we're gonna do this is actually issue these bonds and drive them to these specific initiatives. If you do that, it can put billions of dollars into the US economy to support some of these activities and make changes today. Well, uh, I love those tangible ideas. We all do, Robert. I mean, because a lot of times people, again, just it's talk, but having these ways, these paths forward is, is very, very inspiring and provides, I think, everyone with real hope that we're going to get some real results here. We are going to wrap up this portion of this session. Um, so stick around, please, if you are a WEF participant on TopLink. Otherwise, I, I want to thank uh, the panelists in particular, uh, Minister Ngabiri, Robert Smith, and Hans Vesberg, and thank you all for participating. This is just a jumping off point. I hope you guys are all excited by this Edison Alliance. I want to hear much more about it, and I'm looking forward to some 
real action as we go forward into 2021 and beyond. So again, thanks very much. And uh, let's have everyone walk the talk. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you.